I'm backing up my truck, I'm gonna hook it up, loading up my boat with all my gear. I've been working hard all week, trying to make ends meet, spending time wishing I was fishing. Well, Terry Wickstrom wants to take you fishing. Gather up your gear and come along. Well, Terry Wickstrom wants to take you fishing. This is Terry Wickstrom. Join Karen Collum, Greg Collagio, and me as we take you to some of our favorite fishing spots from Colorado to Minnesota, the Arctic Circle to Central America and beyond. As we revisit episodes of Mountain States Fishing and Angling Adventures Television on the best of fishing with Terry Wickstrom. Well, Pete, you ready? I'm ready, sir. Let's uh, get it. What a beautiful day. It's a beautiful day. Oh, I can't believe this weather. We're in the Colorado Mountains. We're in the Colorado Mountains. The Blue Gunnison Mesa, Valley. Blue Mesa Reservoir, a beautiful sunny day, early brisk morning. We're gonna go catch some trout. Which so we are. This is a no wake area right this in here? This is a no wake till we get to the can buoys out here, and then we're good to go. All right. So what do you think we're gonna start out doing today? I think we'll start working some rip rock type bank, similar to what we have here at the launch ramp. Uh, okay. We'll probably uh, throw some crankbaits and some jigs. You fish trout uh, a lot like bass, don't you? I fish trout just like I was bass. You and I are going to have a good time together because that's my favorite way to fish. That's great. Let's go get after them. All right. How Where big is Blue Mesa? Blue Mesa is about uh, 8,800 acre feet, you know, surface acres. Uh, the reservoir was built back in the, the middle 60s, and it's been touted as the largest lake in the state of Colorado. And I know there's one on the Eastern Plains that's every bit as big. Uh, I think it depends on the water levels in the lakes at the time they measure them. As you can tell now, the water level here is, is coming up pretty good. Now, just a month ago, the water level here was 72 feet down which uh, actually was the second lowest the lake has ever been since it's been built. And that was just anticipation of all the runoff from all the snow in the mountains around here to uh, help out with flooding down, down river. What species can we anticipate catching out here? Blue Mesa has uh, rainbow trout and brown trout. There's a fish right there. All right, you can need the net now. No, I don't think we'll need the net for this one, but uh, Little rainbow. Little rainbow. Ah, oh, it's a good start though. Get us going. Here it is, 7.30 in the morning. 7.30 in the morning and we're in uh, what was it, late spring, early summer. Early summer. It's, uh, we're at a 7,500 foot elevation and it's beautiful. Oh, it's great. Yeah, that's why I put this hat on because, you know, that's, a, I'm gonna, one of the things we don't talk enough about sometimes are people come up to these altitudes to fish, they don't realize how intense the sun can get. Um, sunscreen, a good cap, sunglasses are really important. They really are. For the day fishing. Uh, I actually sunburned, sunburned the whites of my eyes one time five years ago. Wow. I didn't have my right sunglasses with, and the sun reflected off the water. And actually, they had to do, um, I had to get steroid uh, treatments on the white of my eye to treat the sunburn. Wow. I don't know if that gave me strong eyes or not, but I don't see that well. But, but it can really get intense. And a lot of times in the show, people will see me wearing this wide brim hat. Uh huh. And the biggest thing about it is just to keep the sun off me. It really makes a difference. It really does. You know, we're fishing kind of a transition area here with this volcanic rock and this, this sand shoreline here. You know, if we were warm water fishing for bass, you know, that'd be a a prime structure spot that transition from rock to sand. Well, you tell me you fish this lake very similar to the way you fish bass. In fact, this is a, a rock. This is exactly how you and I smallmouth bass fished down at uh, Lake Powell, Powell a couple years ago. Exactly. And, and again, like you said, exactly the same way. The only difference was the fish at the end of the line. Yeah. Yeah. You know, my, my finding is, you know, I fish both bass and walleye tournaments and I've traveled around covered and I write about a lot of different species for the magazines I write for and there's usually something that's traditional in fishing for almost every species that I can translate over to others. Mm -hmm. I mean typically we're trying to imitate some kind of forage and so many of these fish 
eat the same types of forage, either uh, crawfish or minnows, or it's insect life of some kind. And um, if you're doing a good job of imitating that, a lot, a lot of the same tactics will trigger multiple fish. But you know, I've come out to this reservoir, you know, at the peak times of the year, which is generally is right after ice out, and then later in the fall, you know, just as the the last turnover, as people know it, and we call it, you know, stratification. But just as that occurs, you know, the fish really become active here. And I've come to this reservoir with topwater baits, topwater bass baits, and have done really well fishing, and just like I was bass fishing. Not uncommon at all to hear quite a few fish up to the 10 pound range every spring. What about the rainbows? The rainbows here typically are, uh, you know, they, they do spawn here in the spring. And uh, but there's an awful lot that are stocked here as well, and the overall rainbow population here is just catchable size. Uh, you do catch some around the 17 to 18 inch range, but the biggest part of your creel will be just catchables. You know, around 10 to 12 inches. To catch. They can be pretty ornery. Uh, you know, they do real well here. The bank fishermen do fish and power bait and catching them stockable rainbows. Yeah, that's another thing, you know, we're fishing right up on the shoreline here. So people need to know that they can take advantage of these fisheries. You know, if they don't have a boat, they can still come up here and take advantage of this. You know, we do that right at ice out. There isn't enough open water to uh, navigate in a boat or fish from a boat. So basically we do the same thing as we do in our today, but we walk the shoreline and we parallel cast to the shore and just do real well. We're fishing a combination of spoons and crankbaits and jigs. A little later on we'll give you a close-up and talk a little bit. Pete's actually a tackle manufacturer and these are his products. So a little later on in the show we'll give you a little demonstration and close-up of the products we're using and, and a little a few tips on how to fish them. Mm -hmm. We've caught a few fish in here, um, some small rainbows, small browns, but not really the fish we're looking for. We're going to move to another spot on the lake why don't you go take a look at these messages? We'll be in another location when you get back. We uh, picked up and moved to another location on the lake. Exactly where are we now, Pete? Uh, we're in the, there's a fish right there. You interrupted me. All right. <laughs> uh, we're in the West Elk Arm. It, the creek up above here is called West Elk Creek. And uh, this is the lower end of the lake down towards the dam. As you can see the shoreline here, we're kind of in a little different type of terrain. A uh, little steeper bank, a little deeper water. There we go. Oh, a nice little brown. Not huge, but nice. Do you have to net him? No, I think I can get him. Okay. Pretty oh, yeah, fish. That's a nice oh, fish. pretty fish. Nice fish. All right. Oh, he didn't know he was hooked. I got him up by the boat. You sure you don't want the net? Well, I think I can get him in. I just I hate to get tangled up. We're gonna let him go anyway. Oh, nice brown trout. Oh, well he's still nice and alive. Then we get him back in the water. Thank you, Mr. Brown Trout. Let's get a few more of that. That was hey, fun. That's Things what we're after up. right there. That's what we're looking for. Ooh, there one just hit me. I'm throwing a diving crankbait. In fact, it's one of those manufactured by Pete. I'm going to show you the technique. It's a technique I use with diving crankbaits for walleye fishing, and it's what I used to catch that last brown trout. You cast the lure out, you reel it down a few times to get a depth, and you slowly reel it in. And then while you're bringing it in, you kind of watch your line. You keep your rod tip low. And when the line is almost straight below you, then you vertically lift the lure like this. And what happens, that crankbait's going along, it changes direction all of a sudden. And a lot of times that erratic direction change is what triggers the following fish. We were getting a lot of fish following the lures back to the boat. So I tried that technique that we use walleye fishing. And as soon as that lure stops and changed direction, I think instinctively they think the bait is getting away and they strike. Here's one. All right, any size? Uh, that's a not little better really, than rainbows. Oh, that's, that's a little rainbow, another little panner. Uh, he hit that marabou jig that you started with earlier this morning. Yeah, well, I tell you what, if we were fishing for a meal, we've caught plenty of fish. Yeah, definitely. We've been having a good time. That's another thing you come to these lakes up here is that um, we're, you know, we're, hopefully we're going to catch some bigger fish too, but uh, you just have fun because catching numbers of these fish. 
And it doesn't take a real experienced angler to be able to catch a few. In fact, I know a few people that hardly fish at all have been able to come up and just throw a rappel up by the shore and catch a few of these. Sure. Miracles never cease to happen, do they? I know that. <laughs> I'll tell you this, working crankbaits along a, a bank like this, crankbaits and jigs and following a bank like we're bass fishing is one of my favorite mm -hmm. ways to fish. In fact, we're, we're throwing crankbaits that you've, uh, you're the manufacturer of. That's correct. Yeah. In fact, when we get these in, we might want to show them the two different sizes we're throwing here. Okay, I'm in. These are a crankbait that uh, Pete's the actual manufacturer of. What's the actual name of it now? Uh, these are the Popeye Rattler. Popeye Rattler. And these uh -huh. are a couple different sizes. They're available in, I don't know, how many sizes? Two sizes. Two these sizes, two sizes and right here. Multiple uh -huh. colors. And you fish these here all the time. All the time. And this yeah. is the way you like to fish this lake like this, just casting and working along the shoreline. Yep, just working them in and out of the rocks. And then this morning, like when we started out on the flats, you know, I like to get them down rooting around in the mud on them flats. You know, that's that's the other way. When you when you fish this lake, is this the way you were fishing when you uh, did well in those tournaments here? Uh yeah. Actually, I was fishing a flat at that time, as opposed to the rocks. Just a big mud sagebrush you're flat. Casting, casting. But we can tell them a little bit about the tournament. They might be interested. This is a jacket that uh, beat in 1995. You and your dad uh -huh. were the winning team in the tournament. We were the champion team, right? And the year before that, you were runners up. Runners up. Uh -huh. Why don't you tell the people a little bit about that tournament? It might be something they're interested in coming up. What, what time of the year is it at? The uh, it's a, the tournament is hosted by the Kiwanis Club from the town of Gunnison. And the Kiwanis Club uh, uses the, the monies from that tournament to fund scholarship things for the, the high school kids at Gunnison High School. Well, that's great. So it's a real good uh, program. It gets uh, a lot of participation. Every year we get, I'd say, over 100 boats, you know, with two people in every boat to uh, compete in a tournament. And it's always the first weekend in May, you know, providing the ice is off the lake. Some years it's pretty nip and tuck and there'll still be a lot of ice around. But as a rule, it's, it's about a week to 10 days after ice out, which is an excellent, excellent time on and this how much, lake. how much does it cost? The entry fee to the tournament is $80 and per team. Typically, what would a first place team win? Uh, with, with 100 boats, the first place team's gonna win uh, a thousand dollars. That's still pretty neat, and that's a, it's a fun tournament with a good cause. And well, you, well, the year you won it, um, you caught mostly brown trout. We weighed in uh, all brown trout. Rainbows, kokanee, and brown trout are the species that are eligible to be weighed in. They don't allow mackinaws in that tournament. A number one uh, blue fox spinner right here, and uh, I don't know. Maybe we'll get something different going here. Yeah. One lure, and one lure only, and I had to fish anywheres in North America for any species of fish. I think personally I'd probably take a Panther Martin. Would you? Yeah. They're a good lure. Yes, they are. And you know, that gets down to personal preference and confidence. We all have lures that we feel confident with. I probably caught just about everything that swims in this country on a jig at one time or another, mm -hmm. and I like to fish that way. There's times probably when I catch less fish too because I fish the way I like rather than what's mm -hmm. probably the best way to fish at the time. Well, you know, with a jig head, there's so many different ways you can fish it. Here's one too. Hey. The double? Yeah. They're not big, but at least we're catching yeah. them. That's the first double of the day anyway. Yeah, you know, we've caught a ton of these little rainbows. Oh. Got mine on the spinner. You know, you got yours on a little stick bait. Huh? Yeah, we ought to show this to the people. That, now, this isn't a very big fish, but if you want to come up here and just have fun, we caught tons of these little rainbows. I mean, we didn't put a lot of them on camera. I want to get that back in the water. Yeah. But just using these little stick baits, like a rapala, or these little minnow shaped baits, and just kind of reeling them in and twitching them. And um, we were able to catch just numbers and numbers of little fish. You know, th the surprising thing today is. We've caught a lot of fish, but how many different types of lures and different methods did we catch them? Yeah. I mean, spoons, spinners, jerk baits, crank baits. 
We didn't, catch, we didn't catch as many big fish as we hoped today. No, of we course, didn't. it's not over yet. We still might, but we had a great time. We were catching fish just steady. Yeah, we have been. I got that one nice brown. Here's one. Oh, that looks like it might be a little better fish. Might be. Not pulling too hard yet. It's coming up to the top though. That's a little bigger than what we've been catching, whatever it is. That's a brown. Oh yeah, that's a brown. Nice little brown, not huge, but nice fish. I tell you, they're such a beautiful fish, those spots on them. That's what and they're notorious now he, he for. he finally realized you haven't caught. Yeah, uh-huh, he saw the boat then. I'll tell you what, you know, people don't realize the browns are a little tougher to catch than rainbows. That's one of the reasons they, they do get so big. What's some of the bigger browns that have come out of this lake? Uh, you know, every year there's fish four to ten pounds caught. Uh, I know in that first some tournament. Fish before you put it back. Let me get the net. Ease them up, ease them. Always taking drag. I got it. Man, he's taking some drag. Oh yeah, nice fish. There's the one we're looking for. Oh, there. There. all right. Oh. <laughs> you did good with that net. <laughs> That's from old walleye tournament experience. And that's, that's what we're after. That's what we're after. Well, here's your fish. I'll let you take him. You want me to let him loose? You bet. I'm going to let him loose. There's oh, yeah. That's, that's a, a nice, broad oh, fish. Beautiful brown. What were you, you catching him on? I, I put that little mystic rainbow on there. Just, you know, like, like I said earlier, we've been trying so many different things today. What a great a way good, to end the day. That's a good four-pound fish, I'll bet you. Good way to end the day. Good fish. He's still active. He's on back. Oh, yeah. Way to go, hey. sir. <laughs> that was fun. That was great. We're with Pete Du Bois, mm -hmm. who we were fishing with today, and he's a local lure manufacturer. I want to thank you, uh, Pete, for taking us out today and uh, showing us uh, the lake and everything. It was really a good time. And while we were out today, we were actually fishing with a lot of the lures that Pete's company manufactures. So we thought since we had a little time, we'd come into their shop here in Montrose, Colorado, and just kind of walk around here a little bit and show you something about the lures he manufactures and the little operation. This is what we caught the brown trout on today. Yep, it is. Several of them, yeah. anyway. This uh, crankbait is, is a little different configuration and shape than any crankbait you've probably ever seen before. Yeah, it looks like, it, well, it looks like a, what's it called? It's, it's, uh, it's, it's the shape of a tomato worm. It is actually what the shape of it is. And uh, then, you know, of course, we can't come up with our... You think fish eat a lot of tomato worms? Well, I, that it's was just, probably that, something they don't see a lot of, yeah, and therefore I think, they do eat it. I'm kidding you. That <laughs> tomato worm was an inspiration for the right. shape, but it really does have a unique action and a tight wobble. Tell us a little bit about the action of the lure. It does have, a, like you say, a tight wobble to it, even on this larger size lure in comparison to that one, the size of the bill it has. It has a pretty tight wobble as it comes through the water. There's a series of rattles in these chambers that's in this bait that keep the bait um, almost neutrally buoyant. And uh, this larger size right here will dive down to around a depth of 10 feet. You know, that, and that depends on the pound test line you're fishing with. That's what's unique about our product is the bulging eyes, both on the crank plug and on the spoons. Uh, they have big, bright, bulging eyes and uh, yeah, maybe we you know it's it's a known fact that fish in are attracted to their prey uh, by eyeballs, and they they like to strike towards the head portion of their prey, and uh, so that's one of the reasons that we manufacture these baits with the big bulging eyes. You know, I'm kind of intrigued by the spoon. Tell us a little bit about the manufacturing process involved in your spoon, how you start, and what it looks like, and. This particular piece that I have in my hand is the raw product. Now it's made from zinc, correct? It's made from zinc in an injected mold. 
which is kind of different than a lot of other processes for other type spoons. And that's done in Denver? That's done in Denver, in Colorado. And uh, like I said, this piece right here is the raw product. And as you can see, it's kind of rough around the edges and it's, you know, it definitely needs some work. From this process, the spoon goes through a tumbler and a deburring machine that, that makes the product smooth and ready to uh, plate, well, as this one here. You can see the difference how there's no more rough edges and it's smooth and uh, it's ready for the tape or paint. Uh, some of the spoons, you know, we have paint and then the other ones are a chrome. The chrome ones receive uh, tape, a uh, fire tiger pattern tape or a prism tape that uh, gives a lot of reflection to the lure. And adds some color. Adds a lot of color, yes. And all this is done, except for painting, is all done in Colorado. It's all done right here, right here at this table where we're at. I thank you for coming and spending the time with me today. And again, if uh, you come back this fall, you know, the fishing conditions will be a lot better than they were today. I know you promised me we're going to average. What did you say? How big are uh, we going to average this fall? Oh, we're going to have 60, 70 fish day. All right. Yeah, for sure. Well, I look forward to coming back. I had a great time fishing. I learned about Blue Mesa Reservoir, and I do want to come back. Mm -hmm. And I really enjoyed fishing with you and having you show us your operation here. I hope you folks at home enjoyed today's episode as much as I did. It was interesting. We learned some things both about fishing and to making a, what a lure manufacturer does. And we look forward to seeing you next week. I'm Terry Wickstrom, and thank you for joining us on Mountain States Fishing Adventure.